Well, good morning and welcome to Medina Church of the Nazarene. We've all come from different places this week, and we're here for the, the purpose of worshiping our risen Savior, worshiping Christ. We raise a hallelujah. This might be a little newer. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty easy to catch on to, though, so feel free to join, sing along. Uh, if you'd like to stand, you're welcome to stand. If you'd rather sit and sing, you can sit and sing, too. That's okay. Um, whichever posture uh, works best for you here this morning. But we're glad you're here and, uh, and looking forward to what God has in store for our gathering today.
Maybe you knew it, maybe you didn't. Hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. And it is one key reason that we come and, uh, and come attend a service like this. Uh, Psalm 113 says, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. That basically says anywhere and everywhere. Because really the sun never rises or sets. It's always shining somewhere. Or snowing somewhere. But it's always shining somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and so wherever we are and whatever we're doing, uh, it is one of our key uh, responsibilities. It's one of our key joys to, uh, to praise the name of the Lord. Let's continue to do that this morning. Well, 
strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine own. guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense. 
presence, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, it is where you are, and where Maybe seated. Let's uh, let's pray together. Father God, we confess to you today that there are many times when we try to defend ourselves. There are many times when when we try to be righteous on our own through our own uh, efforts, through our own definitions. But Lord, as we've just sung, we acknowledge today. We, we want to give all that up. We want you to be our one defense. You to be our righteousness. We pray that you would fill us fresh and new today. That you would empower us to uh, be the people that you're calling us to be. That we wouldn't be overwhelmed by the, uh, uh, the, the ways that uh, you desire us to live. But that we would allow your spirit to live in us and through us. And Lord I pray that. That through something that, that may even happen here today, that your spirit would, would get a hold of us perhaps in a fresh new way. That we can learn, and not just learn, but that we can become more like you. Lord, we've, uh, we have come here today from, from uh, a variety of different places, not just geographically, but there are things going on in our lives that are different. We are all in different seasons of life, and, and yet we, we come here centered around, uh, focused on, uh, unified by, uh, by you. You, you want to do uh, what only you can do in our lives, in, in your unique ways, and so I pray that, uh, that you would open us 
to whatever you desire for us today. We pray for your forgiveness. We pray for your healing. We, we pray for your encouragement. We pray for your guidance and direction. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is involved in our lives, that, that, that uh, you didn't just create this, this world and then uh, leave us to, uh, to figure it all out on our own, but that you desire a relationship with us. And so, Lord, I pray that, that you would help us to grow in that relationship, that you would draw us closer to you today. Lord, we pray for your guidance and direction in, uh, in our lives. We thank you for this season of Easter just a couple of weeks away now. We pray that you would uh, uh, allow that to be a special time in, uh, in our lives. Not just in our lives, Lord, but I pray that if there are folks that, that uh, may be more open at this point to an invitation to, to come to church on Easter uh, more than any other time, Lord, I just pray that you would, you would draw us to, uh, to, to be uh, the extending invitations. That, that we could see those opportunities and, and step into them and respond. Lord, I, I pray for uh, your continued uh, touch and, uh, and help as, as uh, uh, war continues to go on uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. And we just pray for your, uh, your peace to come to that region. We pray for those who are on the front lines fighting, for those that are on the front lines serving for those who are uh, giving uh, assistance to those who are fleeing. We lift up uh, Ryan Nikolai to you. who will be leaving this week. And we pray for your uh, continued hand upon him as, uh, as he goes. That, that he would uh, continue to follow your direction. And that you would use him in, in mighty ways. Use him in ways maybe he's not even aware of. To bring your, uh, your presence, not just the, the medical insight that he has, but your presence into the situation. Lord, we, we thank you for, uh, for uh, your, your presence who's with each one of us. You've promised that you inhabit the, the praises of your people, that, uh, that, that you are with us right now as we gather. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that, that we can follow you each, uh, each step of the way in our lives. Lord, we, we thank you, we love you, we pray that you'll continue to, uh, to move and work in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It is time for Hope Squadron. So kids, you can head out, and uh, in just a couple of weeks, Easter is on the way. Let's, uh, let's watch this video as we think toward Easter. It's the Easter season. So you're probably hearing a lot of people tell you about why you should invite someone to church. I'm here to tell you why that's a bad idea. You heard me right. Bad idea. Terrible idea. Worst idea ever. Here's why. First of all, it's way too obvious. Inviting someone to an Easter service? It's not subtle. It's not organic. It's not naturally springing from your relationship with unchurched people. Ever heard of friendship evangelism? Ever heard of authenticity? Throw that out the window. If you invite someone to an Easter service, they're going to know exactly what you're up to. You want them to hear about Jesus so they can trust in him, have eternal life in Christ. It's pretty on the nose, don't you think? It's got like zero subtext. People are going to smell that one coming a mile away. Mmm. Thanks, Tom. Second, they might say no. Then what? Then you're both going to spend the rest of your lives pretending like that never happened. They'll probably make up some lame excuse to spare your feelings, but then they're going to need to be really careful to make sure they don't post anything to Instagram or Twitter when they're supposed to be at their Aunt Lucy's bat mitzvah. Newsflash, your neighbor doesn't have an Aunt Lucy, and they think you don't know what a bat mitzvah is because you go to a Jesus church. You just made them into a liar because you asked them to do something weird, and now both of you are going to feel terrible about it forever. Hey Mike, I got six burgers in one stomach, you coming over? Sure. Third, they might say yes. Even worse, what if they actually come to church with you and in spite of all the parking and the singing and the weird people that, yeah, I mean, you've kind of come to love, but let's be honest, are still a little bit warped. What if in spite of all of that, they still get really interested and they start coming every week and then they trust in Christ and then they start coming to you with all their problems and their questions about their faith? What then? You don't have time for that. You can barely manage the relationships you have right now. You added all those friends to your Facebook and now they expect you to like every single witty comment and cat picture they post. How are you going to add an actual relationship with a brand new believer who needs actual, you know, help? Let's be honest. An invitation to an Easter service is just another promise you're not going to deliver on, isn't it? Jason! Yo! Lunch? Fourth, why Easter? Why not Groundhog Day or Arbor Day or St. Swithin's Day? Jesus is still going to be around on Flag Day, isn't he? I mean, this isn't like a limited time offer or anything, right? 
In fact, I bet your neighbors are still gonna be pagans in the fall. Why don't you just wait to do it then? There's no big rush to do it right this second. Easter is a busy day. You've got a sunrise service, you've got an egg hunt, you've got a big family dinner. Inviting someone to church to hear the gospel is just gonna screw up the whole schedule. Looks nice, Steph, thanks. Finally, let's do the math. Do we really need any more people in this place? The more people we have here, the more work there is for everyone. Hello, nursery duty. Hello, kitchen committee. Hello, pastor. No, I would not like to be on the visitation team. Thank you very much. We wouldn't have to do any of this if we could all just agree to stop inviting people to Easter services. Let's get on the same page here. Do not let anyone manipulate you into doing something that makes you feel uncomfortable. Just say no. That's probably what your neighbors were gonna say anyway. Hey Carl, how's it going? How are the kids? Awesome. So I wouldn't want to manipulate you in any way, but we do have quite a few things uh, on, uh, on the docket for uh, the Easter season. Today is the day, the last day to order flowers. Those forms are right by the, uh, where you picked up a bulletin and where you can put your, your offering, uh, right by the door, just to the left of the door. Uh, if you didn't grab one, uh, no one will, will uh, uh, judge you if you get up even right now and grab one of those. And uh, you can put those uh, order blanks in. We'll be ordering those flowers this week. Uh, make sure you fill those out and, um, and then with those flowers will decorate our platform on Sunday morning of Easter Sunday and then you can take them home with you. So make sure that you do that. Also, uh, want to invite you to uh, help out with the Easter egg hunt in uh, the Montville Township Easter egg hunt. They have uh, asked for some volunteers and uh, I have volunteered you. So many of you, several of you, uh, uh, have uh, have said you're going to head up there after church next week, uh, and so that uh, that is there, and I thank you for that great opportunity for us to to serve the uh, the families of our community. Also, uh, a week from Friday, so on Good Friday, the Friday right before Easter, we will be having our combined service that we uh, have done for, for quite a few years with several of the other Nazarene churches in the area. This year, that service is at the Orville Church, uh, now Church Orville Campus. I guess I've got to call it that, uh, but uh, that is uh, the address is there in your bulletin and up on the screen, and uh, if you Google it, you'll find a direction. So anyway, Anyway, all of those things, Good Friday service, uh, and uh, I hope that you'll take advantage of that worship opportunity in, uh, in your Easter celebrations. Fourth thing is, uh, is something new, and that is on Easter Sunday, we hope to have an Easter choir. Tyler, hey, tell us all about yes, it. Good, all right. So, uh, one rehearsal, pretty much, uh, is what we're planning, and we're going to try to get some uh, little tracks and learning materials and music out in advance, so that's why uh, the email is up there, but... Uh, whether uh, you love singing and sing all the time and, and want to get involved in, you know, worship team or anything like that. By the way, if that's you, please tell me. Or if you just prefer singing in groups and you feel like your voice works better in a, in a larger group, uh, we would love to have you join us. It's, it's not going to be anything too difficult, don't worry. Um, I, probably some of it will even be familiar, uh, I'm guessing. Uh, some of the music would be. Uh, but we're going to meet uh, Thursday and uh, that's uh, the 14th, so the Thursday before Easter at 7.15-ish, and, uh, and we'll get things organized and started, and it's going to start the service, so it's not going to be, you're not going to have to be up front the whole time on Easter Sunday. The plan is right now to have the, the choir ensemble start the service and, and get our, our corporate singing and, and music started together, and then uh, allow you to go back to your seats if you'd like to, uh, uh, to be there for the rest of the service with your family. So it's next year for the Easter cantata, there right? We go. It's not this year. Next yeah. year, cantata is quite a. That, that's a musical, right? But we're not not doing sure. that this and if year. You do it's that, not you a big. Don't usually do that on, on the Easter yeah, Sunday that's true. morning. That's I right. Suppose. Okay. But, All right. You know, but yeah, this this would just be uh, just a couple couple songs. So nothing. Uh, there's no story. No no costumes that you have to wear or anything like that. So. <laughs> Uh, now, if you want to do that, let me know, but, <laughs> but don't get nervous if you're, if you're fearful here today. Just come, come out uh, that Thursday, but uh, if possible, it helps to send me a little email before, and then, like I said, I can prepare some learning materials and, and things like that, too. Awesome. Cool. Great. So I hope you'll, uh, you'll do that. Maybe you're logged in online and you want to be a part of that. Uh, feel free to do that as well. We'd love that. 
Uh, maybe you notice there's a big pile that has uh, been forming in the, in the foyer uh, with items that, uh, that Ryan is going to take with him or make sure get to Ukraine as he goes uh, uh, in just a few days. And so if you didn't bring items for that but still want to donate, there is a QR code right there. And, um, uh, also, or you can, you can get on the church website and, uh, and uh, just make a donation through the church and the church will, uh, will uh, make sure that gets to the right place. Um, a, or you can like put cash in the bucket and we can uh, make sure that happens too or write a check. Just make sure you write that and put Ukraine on that and we will get it to the right place. And uh, so we are, uh, we are thankful already that for the overwhelming response uh, uh, for, for items that, uh, that, that will be uh, distributed to, uh, to folks in need there uh, coming up very shortly. So um, thank you for that. If you have any questions, Ryan's right there in the back, and you can talk to him right after church about that. So um, uh, maybe you grab some popcorn on the way in. I hope that you did. You have popcorn out there in the foyer uh, because tomorrow night uh, you're having popcorn with Jesus, right? Uh, the uh, first uh, session of the chosen Bible study. We'll watch the, uh, the episode and then uh, have some discussion about that, and uh, popcorn will be served. Don't get used to it. We're not serving popcorn every Sunday morning, but Monday nights. So uh, uh, be here six fifteen tomorrow, and th- that will uh, uh, we'll go through those uh, those episodes together this spring. And then just one more thing to uh, to let you know: the dates for Vacation Bible School are locked and loaded, and our theme is locked and loaded. And if you can participate and help with Vacation Bible School this summer during the week of June thirteenth through the seventeenth, uh, please see Teresa Morris, and she will. Uh, help you to uh, to know where you can serve in what capacity and, and what that looks like. So uh, the uh, um, the information is there in your bulletin, and will be there will be a meeting in a few weeks uh, as we get organized for that. So uh, that is uh, that gets you all up to speed. Easter and everything else, we are excited about uh, not just being busy, right? We're excited about what God is leading us into through the uh, uh, through the spring. Believe it or not, it's spring, and uh, we are excited about. Uh, celebrating Easter and, and continuing the ministry that God has for us uh, in and through the church. Well, let's, uh, let's prepare for part two of our From the Ashes series as we, uh, as we watch this. Did you chew this up? Mm-hmm. What did you do? Mm-hmm. Huh? Get it over. Get it over. Get it over. Mira cómo me dejaron la plantilla. ¿Quién fue? ¿Eh? Denver, did you do this? Denver, was this you? Denver, you won't look at me. Did you? What? Denver, did you do this? Cooper, did you eat all of your treats? 
Cooper. Who did that? Seems to have a problem, don't we? What is this? Come here. <laughs> Benny, cheers. <laughs> Benny. <laughs> I think maybe we can, uh, we can relate to some of that. Sometimes, not only our dogs, but I think we uh, have a hard time admitting when we've done something wrong. Uh, maybe you've uh, uh, tried to hide something outright, or uh, you've, you've tried to, to not uh, fess up necessarily because, uh, because you had uh, the fear of, of the punishment that was coming. Uh, if we had time today, I would love to go around and just hear your stories growing up of when you, uh, you got caught doing something and decided maybe you'd try to try to get out of it, right? And, um, and uh, ad admitting guilt, I think, is, is difficult. Last week, we, we spent some time on the, sub, the, the topic of temptation, and we learned from Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Uh, I told you that, that, uh, that we're all tempted, but we don't have to give in to temptation, right? Uh, but then the question is, well, what if we do? Uh, what, what if we mess up, and we know we've messed up? Uh, what happens then? Well, uh, what is the, the road to recovery, the road to redemption, to rise from the ashes and to restore our relationship with God after we sin? Well, there is a way back, uh, and it involves this whole concept of confession. And when you hear that word, confession maybe you your your mind quickly goes to a uh, a catholic church setting where they have a booth specifically for that right and uh, uh, you can come in at certain times and and uh, sit there with uh, just you and the priest and you can confess your sin and the priest hears that confession and uh, imposes some form of of penance and and uh, on behalf of god extends forgiveness I heard about a Nazarene preacher in a small town who had befriended the Catholic priest down the street. And, and uh, they, were, they were good friends uh, for years. And it just so happened at some point that the priest was going out of town and was going to miss the designated time to, uh, to hear confession that week. And so uh, he, he talked to his friend, the Nazarene pastor down the street, and, and uh, said, well... I mean, could you just sit in for me? You could, you could just, just sit in there in the, in the booth. You can do that. And the, the, the pastor there, the Nazarene pastor, said, well, I, I have no idea what to, what to do or how that works. It's always simple. It's simple. They're going to come in. Somebody's going to sit down. They're going to say, Father, I've sinned three times this week. And then you're going to say, uh, put a dollar in the offering plate. Go your way and sin no more. It's just that easy. You just, that's just what you have to do. They're going to come in. You just, uh, that's just how it works. And so the, the Nazarene preacher figured that, uh, that he could handle that. And so the next week the priest uh, went on his trip. And the, and the preacher nervously took his place in the booth. And, and sure enough, the first person comes in and, and, and said, Father, I've sinned three times this week. And the preacher said, oh, I know what to do here. He, he said, uh, uh, put a dollar in the offering plate, go your way, and sin no more. And that's what happened. And uh, several more times it happened. And uh, just like that, uh, Father, I've sinned three times. Uh, put a dollar in the offering plate. Go your way and sin no more. And then someone came in and sat down and said, Father, I've sinned two times this week. And the preacher was like, oh, I don't, what, I, I'm not. And he finally said, go your way and sin once more. There's a special this week, three for a dollar. 
Not quite how it works, is it? That's not, uh, not quite the, uh, the, the thing. But I, I do believe, however, that confession is indeed good for the soul. We, we don't have to uh, necessarily confess to a person or to a, a priest in order to be forgiven, but confessing our faults, our, our shortcomings, our sins to each other and to God uh, is, is taught throughout Scripture, right? Uh, one discipline that should be practiced regularly in our life with God is this, uh, this discipline of confessing our sins. One of, the, one of the great pictures uh, in the Bible of true confession is given to us by Jesus as he told the parable of the prodigal son. It's in Luke chapter 15 beginning in verse 11. Let's, uh, let's read it together today. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It, it says, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have, enough, uh, have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as your hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His, father, his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has, has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. And we'll, we'll stop right there for today. It's a familiar story. Uh, there's there's a, a, a decent chance you've, you've heard it before. The, the kid disrespects his dad, uh, sows his wild oats, regrets it, comes home groveling, and his dad shows love and grace. Good story, right? Uh, classic story. But it, it's not just a classic story. It's not just a 2,000 year old story. It's not just a Bible story. This story is also our story. I, I, probably, maybe you haven't disowned your parents and run away and wasted all their money. Maybe you have, and, and, uh, but, but I would guess uh, maybe you haven't. This story, though, illustrates the devastating effects of sin the importance of confession and repentance, and the wonders of grace and forgiveness. This whole concept of sin, though, uh, I, I think we get tripped up on that maybe uh, in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the world today. Uh, this, this world where anything goes and, and uh, it's kind of a strange concept that, that I can't just do whatever I want to do. Uh, the, the word sin in scripture simply means missing the mark. Uh, it's it's kind of like uh, like you're seeing up there, darts uh, on a dartboard or not on a dartboard. Uh, we've missed the mark, the, the arrows, the darts haven't hit the target. Uh, the concept of sin assumes then that there is a mark to be hit, a standard, a standard established by God, and we've missed that mark, that standard. We haven't hit the standard. And, and so in missing the mark, we've separated ourselves then uh, from, from our Heavenly Father. So I guess, I guess if you don't believe that there's a God, or if you don't believe that He has authority to establish guidelines to follow, then, then you're not too concerned about sin. Uh, but, but, but if you believe that there is a relationship with God the Father to be enjoyed, then sin is the selfish behavior that breaks that relationship. I've noticed uh, uh, in our social media saturated culture, uh, we don't do confession very well, I don't think. Uh, 
We tend to put our best foot forward, our best face forward, our most edited, curated posts are the ones that get put up, and then we call that being authentic, right? We're going to be our authentic self. I only took 26 pictures and uh, put a couple of filters on it, and then I put it up as my authentic self, right? And, and so, because we want to look good, uh, man, there's no room in that for confession, because that would be admitting that maybe we haven't hit the mark, we, we instead, we make excuses for ourselves if things don't quite, don't quite go right, or we don't act appropriately, or, or whatever, we, and, and we, we kind of skip over those things. But, but then if we see or find out about uh, other people that, that have missed the mark, there's not a whole lot of slack that we give to, uh, to, to other people's faults. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, we are quick to judge, and we are slow to confess. We are quick to judge and we are slow to confess. And I wish that was just in culture, in the world, in social media land. But I'm not sure that church culture is much better. Many times we're also quick to judge and slow to confess, I, I, we we're part of a, a a holiness church too, right? Where where uh, uh, but we so we have the expectation of of holy living, of 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 living a holy life that God empowers us uh, uh, to to live a holy life, and and so we put our best foot forward, our best face forward, and that could also look like hiding where we miss the mark. Because the expectation is that we've got it all together, right? And so we're living the holy... Sure, pastor, I'm, I'm uh, living an abundant life. Just don't look too close because I'm really struggling here and here and here and I'll never show you this. In the middle of, of those contexts, both in the church and out of the church, we have the, we have the story of the prodigal son. It's a, it's a story where... I don't know, I think we tend to put other people's faces on the prodigal son, right? And we celebrate. If, if they get their heads on straight and turn around and come home, and that's great, and, and we're, we're uh, happy about that, and we should be. But I, I guess as we, as we walk through this familiar story today, I, I, I want us to consider that maybe we are all the prodigal at times. Failing to own up to where we may be missing the mark. Where we're, we make excuses, where we ignore sin, and where we distance ourselves from our Heavenly Father. So maybe, maybe you need to consider that you might actually have something to confess. Maybe I have something to confess. That, that this sermon isn't just for someone else, but it might be for each of us. Personally, and so I, I guess I just want us to be as it's so. Man, we we walk in, and some of these things just seem so familiar. Oh, he's preaching on the prodigal son uh, today. I've heard that. Uh, check that off. I can kind of zone out. Uh, I, I guess the challenge is for me, uh, and maybe for all of us today. I, I just want us to be open to the whisper of the Holy Spirit across our souls today. That it might just be for us, <laughs> because uh, confession is an important thing that maybe we don't always do. Confession begins with examination, and I think maybe we, we don't even get started because we just don't want to go there, right? We just don't want to even step into that. The prodigal son had, had really gotten himself uh, in, into some stuff, right? I mean, he, he had asked his dad for part of the inheritance, which was quite an insult. Basically, this kid is telling his father, I want your money more than I want a relationship with you. Kind of wish you were dead because then I'd have all this money. And, uh, and, and I mean, it's pretty harsh pretty harsh stuff. And, and so then he, he gets the money and uh, runs away and, and uh, from everything familiar and he goes and spends the money on what uh, scripture describes as wild living. This, this is the only place in scripture that that uh, Greek term is used uh, and it's described as, uh, I, I guess we could summarize it as an extravagantly wasteful lifestyle. And uh, there's some indication of what all that entails, uh, and we can dream up the rest, but uh, he's just wasting this money uh, hand over fist. The money didn't last forever, and he spent the last dollar about the same time that a famine hit, and the only job he could get was in a pig pen, and it was then that he finally stopped long enough to examine 
his behavior. Up until then, it was all about him and having fun and going and doing what he wanted to do. And there wasn't any room for examination of his soul, for heaven's sakes. But when he's, he lost it all and he's hit rock bottom, then he realizes that something needs to change. And I think it's just too bad that it took him so long. And, and yet we do that, don't we? We, we wait to deal with sin until it's, uh, it's pretty messy and uh, pretty hard to get it all untangled. Uh, but the longer, the longer sin stays in our lives, the harder it is to get rid of. It, it, it gets rooted in deep. I, I remember uh, at, uh, man, more than one house where we've lived where, where we were redoing the landscaping and, and stuff. And so we were, uh, we meaning me, uh, pulling out, digging out uh, 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 shrubs and, and uh, uh, bushes. I kind of enjoy getting my hands dirty sometimes. And, and uh, we just, uh, just dig down. I mean, it's, it's rough if you've ever done that. Maybe... Maybe you were smart, like, uh, like I've known some people, and you just get a chain and a truck, and you just drive until, uh, until it just comes out, right? But, uh, uh, I mean, uh, multiple shovels and an axe and some pry bars and, man, a lot of sweat, maybe even, uh, maybe even a little yelling was involved, right? And uh, 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 the longer that that bush had been planted there, the harder it was to get out. And I'm not saying that that bush was a sin incarnate, but I felt like it by the end of the day, right? But, um, but sin has a way of sending its roots down deep in our lives. And the longer that it's there, the longer we don't deal with it, the harder it is to dig out. To be honest, the, the longer it's there, the, the longer it takes to even recognize that it's a problem. Oh, it's not that big a deal. I've always been involved with that. We, we, get, we tend to get used to it. Henry Blackaby once wrote, The tragedy is that many of God's people can know they are living their lives the same as the world around them without it disturbing them. But, but regular times of examination, of, of thinking, evaluating, allowing God to access your life can, can help to root out those, those sinful habits. You don't have to wait to hit rock bottom like the, the prodigal son did. We need to spend time regularly walking through our souls with God. Maybe that's a great uh, word picture for us, that, that, that we're allowing him access to each and every corner of every part of our lives uh, regularly. And, and God, is there anything that you want to, is there anything that, that needs to be rooted out? Ask him to reveal himself and, and, uh, and anything that doesn't belong in our lives. It, don't wait for the pig pen. <laughs> Examine yourself Regularly, I, that's the, 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 the first step in, in confession is recognizing that, that something even has to happen. And then included in that, I think, as we're open to that, we, we, there, we have to be honest about, uh, about what's going on. The prodigal son was, was finally honest about what he had done. He knew he needed to own up to, to uh, the, the, the failings, that, the, the things that he'd done, uh, the, the hurts that he had caused. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't blame anyone or anything. He didn't try to say, well, if that blasted famine hadn't come, I'd still be squeaking buy or he, he didn't blame the people uh, they wasted all my money and and it's their fault and 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 it's easy to make excuses it's hard to admit wrongdoing and to own up to our behavior i think it's kind of like those dogs where man they just wish there's regret there right uh and uh, they got caught and uh, it's time to fess up, right? But, but, but when, we, when we sin, if we're going to restore the relationship uh, with, our, with our Heavenly Father, we have to be honest and we have to own up to our failures. John Ortberg uh, once wrote, Confession means saying that somewhere in the mix was a choice. The choice was made by us. And it does not need to be excused, explained, or even understood. The choice needs to be forgiven. We, we need to, like the prodigal son, simply come to our senses and realize that our life will never be what it was meant to be apart from the Father. We have to be honest. And then included in that is a sorrow for the sin that has been committed. A whole lot of times we confess only, only when we've been caught, right? Right? Maybe that's just me. I don't know. I, I think maybe one of the things that kept me on the uh, relatively on the straight and narrow growing up wasn't necessarily a deep desire to do the right thing. I was just afraid of getting caught and what those consequences might be. I, I mean, being afraid that Jesus or or your parent or whoever uh, somebody that somebody is watching. 
that, and you know that there's punishment that's going to be involved for that behavior, that might be effective in keeping you from doing wrong for a while, but it won't usually translate, doesn't always translate into a heart that has a deep desire for God. We have to have the want to, right, deep down inside ourselves. It's not just external uh, pressures forcing us to be good, but we have to have that desire, the, that, that sorrow for sin. I, I love the old joke, how many counselors does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to want to change. Uh, yeah, I liked it better than you did, I guess, but uh, anyway, um, we can't legislate morality. We can't force people to be good just because we have the rules and, and the punishments in place. Uh, you know, those things are, are important and, and, uh, and we need, but, but it's not, it, it, those aren't going to force us to change on the inside. Real confession comes from a sorrow in our hearts that we've acted wrongly and we want to change. We want to restore that relationship. True confession involves a deep sorrow for sin. James chapter 4 uh, verses 8 through 10 describe that. He says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. If and when you realize that there's, there's sin in your life, you should grieve over it, James tells us. There isn't any room for, for justifying behavior, explaining it away. Well, if, if this had happened, or, or if this person had, or, or I can't be held responsible for, I mean, it's the, it's the image uh, of that prodigal son on the road back home, falling at the feet of his father, burying his, his uh, face in the folds of his father's robe, begging for forgiveness because he's so sorry for what he's done. So deeply desiring to never do that again. And that's really the fourth part I think of, of uh, confession. Is a promise not to repeat the offense. I mean the prodigal did this in the very act of coming home. He didn't think there was, there was any way he was ever going to be restored to, to uh, uh, as his father's son again. But maybe he'd get servant status in the household. He was resolutely determined not to... Uh, do what he had done before. Uh, I don't know if in your house, when uh, if if uh, your kids, uh, you know, if they mess up, maybe uh, I remember, uh, you know, making sure our kids said sorry to each other, right? If they messed up, say you're sorry, say you're sorry. How how did that turn out, Pastor? Well, not too great, really. Um, uh, you can usually tell if it's sincere. And uh, a lot of times it's not sincere, right? You can tell just by uh, uh, the, the barely audible sorry and the, you know, and the grouchy and the, you know, you just, uh, true confession is more than being forced to say you're sorry. I mean, you might confess with your words, but it's not this deep sorrow uh, and this desire not to repeat it. True confession is being so sorry you desperately avoid ever doing it again, want to avoid doing it again. You, you remember the pain that you caused, and with the help of God, you'll, you'll avoid that in the future. Also involved in confession is, is a, the concept of restitution. People know how sorry we are by the extent to which we go to make things right. The prodigal son was willing to work off his sin as a slave. Uh, when, when you truly own your sin, you want to do whatever it takes to make it right again. There, there was once a, a machinist at the Ford Motor Company in Detroit who, who, who became a Christian. And uh, he, he, had, he had responded to the invitation at church and, and he was baptized and, and immediately he sensed the Holy Spirit convicting him of some things that, that he needed to make right, including making restitution for some of the, the parts and tools that, that he had, that had quietly kind of made its way into his pockets and into his, uh, in, uh, he had taken things from the company, uh, tools and parts over the years. So the next morning, uh, uh, he felt this conviction, and the next morning he, uh, he brought those tools and parts back, and he explained uh, to his boss how he had uh, been baptized and, and had asked for, uh, for forgiveness from God, but he also needed to ask forgiveness from his, from his foreman and, and told him that he had taken these things, and here they were. 
and making restitution. And it was, it was such an amazing turn of events that the foreman told his boss and, uh, and, and that guy related it to his boss. And, and that guy cabled, sent a cable to uh, Mr. Ford himself who was in, in Europe at a plant in Europe at the time. And, and uh, the, the story goes that Mr. Ford is said to have immediately returned a telegram with this message. Dam up the Detroit River and baptize the entire city, he said. True confession involves restitution. And I guess my definition of that is doing whatever it takes to make things right again. Examination, honesty, sorrow for sin, promising not to repeat it, restitution. I mean, this stuff is... Confession is not for the faint of heart. It's probably why we tend to skip over this and avoid it and just kind of put up walls and and, uh, just kind of hide things because it's hard to walk through this process. The main character quality we need in order to be doing all of these things is humility, right? I messed up. I don't have it all together. Others might judge me. I'll have to face consequences for this. As, as one author put it, confession is good for the soul but bad for the reputation. But, but through it all, the result of confession is restoring our relationship with God. And that's worth anything that we would have to go through in the process. The, the prodigal son, it says in, in scripture here, that he finally came to his senses. He, he knew he had no choice but to throw himself on the mercy of his father. He, he didn't know what the response was going to be. He was hoping that, uh, that, that um, uh, the, his father would at least accept him as a, as, as a servant. He, he could have been rejected outright. Or technically, according to the law at the time, a rebellious child could be stoned for their rebellion. The most that this guy dared hope for was to be kept on as the hired help. But you and I, in our vantage point today, have an advantage over the prodigal son. He didn't know what his father would say when he came and threw himself on the mercy of his father. But, but we do. 1 John 1, nine says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We know that what our Father's response will be when we confess. He's already promised to forgive us. He's, he's promised to cleanse us, to make us new again. We don't have to wonder and hope, oh, is God going to forgive me uh, for this? As we walk through that process of confession and repentance, we know what God's response will be. God desires more than anything to restore that relationship and, and to, uh, to, to accept us back and to forgive. It's, it's not just a, a flippant forgiveness, however. It's all because of Jesus. I want you to hear the heart of, of your father today. Uh, as, as I continue to read in that passage in 1 John, uh, uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess uh, he's faithful to just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness, uh, then chapter 2, verse 1 says this. And I want you, to, want you to hear the heart of your father this morning. It says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The heart of the Father for you today is don't sin. Oh, you can avoid so much if you don't sin. Don't do it. Don't sin. Don't give in to temptation. You can do that. That's last week. Uh, we, we talked about don't give in. But if you do, there's Jesus. <laughs> if you do, there's Jesus. We're going to uh, close our service today with worship and communion. Our, our uh, worship team is going to come up and... Um, I just felt like it was a great opportunity for us to kind of put an exclamation point on all that, uh, that we've seen today in the story of the prodigal son. It's an opportunity for us to, to, to walk through this story personally today. We need to come to the table in, in humility. 
asking God to, uh, to, to examine our hearts, to examine our lives, we have the opportunity to confess anything that comes to mind and to celebrate his forgiveness and his cleansing and his grace. It, it could be that, uh, that before you come to the table, you need some time at the altar. And, uh, and, and I would encourage you to do that if that's, if that's you. Take the time to allow God to examine your heart, to bring you to that place of, of forgiveness and cleansing, of wholeness and healing. And then as we, uh, as we receive the elements, the, the, the bread and the cup representing the body and the blood of Christ, I, I hope that it emphasizes, that it highlights, underlines, circles. <laughs> Don't sin. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. There's Jesus. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The sins of the whole world. Don't sin, but if you do, there's Jesus. Please stand with me. Uh, I'm going to pray. We're going to start singing as you feel led to, uh, to, to, to uh, come and receive the elements. Come and pray. I would challenge you to do that. And you can come and, and receive the elements. Uh, again, as I tell you, there's a, there's a trash can to throw the cups away behind that wall there. And if you're joining us online, maybe you could hit pause and, and find some elements, uh, uh, the bread and the cup, where you can receive communion as well. But let's take the time to, to truly make sure that we're in step with the Father today. Father God. Thank you that we can call you Father, that, that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but you extend your grace and your love. Lord, I pray that as we, uh, as we uh, have this time to examine our hearts, that we allow you to, to walk through our souls, that we'll be humble enough to, to receive your instruction and your, your direction, and that if needed, that we will recognize that we need your forgiveness and your cleansing. Father God, we thank you for the gift of confession and for the restoration of the relationship that it brings. In Jesus' name, amen. I've carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now. I'm laying it down. And I know that I need you. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. saw my condition and had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Again and again and again and again. My heart has been in your sights long 
Lord God, the word thank you doesn't seem like enough as we think about all that you have provided for us. We pray that you would uh, lead us through the process of confession if and when we, we need it every time. That we wouldn't wait, that we wouldn't hide, but that we would recognize that we have a Father who does not treat us as our sins deserve and has already provided for our forgiveness and our cleansing in Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we go from here and we go into uh, the, the lives that we live, we know that there will be temptations to face. We pray that you would empower us not to sin, but if we do, help us to know that we have Jesus and that makes all the difference. Lord, I pray that you would go with us, that your spirit would empower us, enable us to be your called people in the world where we live. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.